Well, good morning. Let me get situated here real quick. So, uh, this morning we're continuing our story. Usually I have some funny story or something I can tell, but we've got a lot to cover this morning. Um, I can thank Miles for that because he didn't uh, go into a whole lot of detail of the end of his message last week. Um, This morning, as you see on the screen, we're talking about David, uh, king of Israel. Uh, Before we get into that, though, I I need to to share something with you that uh, last weekend, I wasn't here. Uh, Some of you may have known that. Some of you probably didn't even notice. That's okay, because I'm usually not in here that much. But uh, last week, I took a group of uh, screaming junior high students along with... uh, Trinity Dawson and Faith uh, Camerata and Jason and Lisa Miller to a overnight, basically 24 hours of screaming madness called CIY Believe. It's strictly for junior high students. Um, to us adults, it's tiring. I never knew that junior high boys never got tired. Actually, I did know that, but... Uh, um, it was a good weekend. It was, it was a wonderful time. I think the kids got a lot out of it. And the, the cool thing is, um, I kind of had an idea where they were going with their whole theme for this year. Uh, it's, it was titled The After Tour. And Saturday night when the, the main session started and the first speaker uh, got up to start talking, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what are they going to go with? What are they going to talk about this year? Right off the bat, the word, the name, David was mentioned. So right then and there, I already knew I was preaching this message today, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, whew, tuned in. I am like stealing half of the stuff they are talking about, and I am not going to deny that. So most, if there's any junior high kids in here today, you're probably going to hear a lot of the same stuff you heard last week, which that's okay because the adults need to hear it as well. But I give uh, most of the credit for a lot of these ideas. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that out there to a guy by the name of Scott Rubin. He is a uh, youth minister formerly in the Chicago area. Now he's in the Cincinnati area. He was our main speaker last weekend. But it was called the After Tour, focused on the life of David. And why is it called the After Tour? Because as we all know, David is known as a man after God's own heart. You know, so I'm sitting there thinking this week, about David and his life, you know, and, and the events over the last couple of weeks that have happened, you know, here at Crossroads, we've been through a lot the last couple of weeks, you know, and, and uh, Monday morning, this past Monday, uh, last Monday, you know, I had the opportunity to be a part of a wonderful service for Bob, Ed- Bob Edwards. Um, I was honored to be a, a pallbearer, and when I thought of Bob, Seriously, if those of you who know Bob would totally agree with me on this, that if you think of any person that is not in the Bible that could equal possibly David, a man after God's own heart, I thought of Bob. I mean, Bob was a guy who didn't shy away from his faith, didn't care who he might offend in handing them a crossroads pen and say, hey, you should probably think about coming to church I mean, Miles shared in, in the, the funeral one day, I mean, this was after I was on staff. Bob had, he always had pens with him. He always handed out our Crossroads pens, which was awesome. He actually, we got a new shipment of them in, a new style of pen. And he saw me coming in here one day, and he stopped me, and he handed me a pen and said, Hey, you should really think about coming and joining us for service. And he knew, he knew me, but it was the fact that I'm in there with the, the teenagers most of the time. Just his sense of humor and... I loved that about Bob, and, you know, I just wanted to touch on that, that one, I got to be a part of that, and two, I got to be a part of uh, his life here at Crossroads, which was very honoring for me and for anyone who came in contact with Bob, and it just seemed fitting that I present this message, message today about David, because David was a man after God's own heart, and I truly believe that Bob was the same type of man. He lived his life God-centered, and God was the focus of his entire life, and it just infected everyone around him. So I just want to say thank you to Bob, who is watching us now, and hopefully we give him honor with this message. 
So back to David. So why was David so special? I want, that's an open-ended question. I want you guys to be thinking about throughout this message. Why was David so special? Today we're going we're gonna to cover a lot of material. We are flying through almost an entire book, it seems like, the length of it. Um, and Kenny, if Kenny's in here, he's going to get a kick out of this because he told me to say this, and I'm going to give him credit. So if you have your cell phones, take out your cell phones and flip to chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. I told you, first service, there wouldn't be that many. Okay, now if you have your Bibles, you can open your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. It's funny that we said this. The guys that were up here, they were giving me a hard time saying, well, I'm not going to use my phone. And, and to be honest, I have to make a confession that if I was sitting out there, I'd probably have my phone and be reading the Bible on my phone. How many, honestly, let's show of hands. Who, who looks at the, reads their Bible off of their phone? Don't be shy. I do. I'm not going to lie. I do. It's just kind of easier. I mean, it's, it's, she got it. Look at that. Yeah, the girl. That a girl. And then show a hand. Obviously, everyone else reads their Bible, and if you don't have one, they're under the pews. But anyway, we're going to be flying through a lot of material today, starting in um, chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. This is where we kind of learn about David. This is where God's story of David, the man after God's own heart, really, really begins. We're not going to, I'm not going to read it, it's just too much. I'm just going to kind of tell the story as God tells it in his word. So in, in chapter 16, we see Samuel. God comes to Samuel. At this, point, at this moment in time, God has kind of left Saul. Saul has rejected God. God rejected him. God is basically saying, okay, we got to find somebody new. So God tells Samuel, go to Bethlehem. Go to Bethlehem and seek out a man named Jesse. Who's Jesse? Jesse was David's father. So Samuel goes to Jesse, finds Jesse, and says, God has sent me for your son. Now Jesse didn't know, yet, or, or Samuel didn't know Jesse had eight sons at the moment. So Samuel says, I'm to anoint, anoint your son as the next king of Israel. So Jesse, first of all, brings in all of his sons, for, you know, one after the other. And then, every single one that came forth, Samuel was like, that's not it. God kept telling him, that's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one. And finally, all of the ones that Jesse thought were worthy of being anointed king, because they were bigger, stronger, more attractive, just fitting the role of a king, Samuel said, no, that's not it. Samuel asked the question, well, is this all the sons you have? And Jesse said, well, no, I got one more. But he's just a boy. And he's out in, the, out in the fields tending the flocks. And so Samuel says, well, go get him. Send for him. Samuel didn't leave. Samuel stayed right there with Jesse until David got there. David comes in. And as soon as he walks in the door, God tells Samuel, this is the one. This is the one that's going to lead my people. I chose him, a simple boy. And I love this story, and I, I love teaching it to, to teenagers and, and younger kids because it shows that just because you may be young, God can't use you. Because God can use anyone. And sometimes I think in our world today that God uses young people, teenagers, or even, even young adults more than he uses the older people in the church. I don't know why. Maybe it's because they have more energy. Maybe it's because they don't know how to be quiet. And if they're really strong in their faith, they're going to talk about it nonstop. Trust me, I've seen it. And it's, in, it's infectious when you get around that. So David is a teenager at this, at this point. He's, he's Jesse's youngest son. And Saul, or I'm sorry, Samuel, just anointed him to be king. Now, when he anointed him, that doesn't mean David actually became king right then and there. As we read through the, the story, 
we're going to see when David actually becomes king. But at this moment, Saul just anoints him as a, as a young boy, as a teenager, and basically says to, to David, you are God's chosen king. God sent me here to make you king. Now put yourself in David's shoes. You're 15 years old. You have no idea. You're out. You think you're going to be a shepherd the rest of your life, spending time with sheep out in the middle of nowhere. And this old guy comes to you and says, hey, God told me you're going to be king of Israel. I don't know about you, but I'd be a little scared if I was 15 years old and Samuel came to me and said, you're going to be king. So put yourself in David's shoes through all this. That's chapter 16. If you're following through chapter 17, we see several things that David goes through. After David is anointed by, by Samuel, then he goes into service for, for, for Saul as his heart player. And then we see the, the part where David, the, probably the most famous David story that we read about is where he defeats Goliath. I'm not going to spend too much time on that because fairly certain most of us know the story. But the cool thing is after David defeats Goliath, he then finds favor, Saul finds favor in him. He's like, wow, this kid as a boy, God truly is with him. I mean, if you look at the odds, there's no way David should have defeated Goliath. Goliath is like nine feet tall, makes me look like a shrimp, and David is a mere boy. And he defeats him with a rock. Who does that? No one physically should be able to do that unless they truly are in God's favor, which David was. So right then and there, Saul sees that. So David then becomes a great warrior. That's where the warrior part starts. After he defeats Goliath, people look up to him. They look to him for leadership. And then David becomes a great warrior in Israel's army. And then whatever Saul gave him an assignment to do, he did that so successfully that Saul gave him, David, a high ranking in the Israel army. He moved up very quickly in the army, which led into chapter 18, where you see Saul's jealousy for David. Now, if we read about that, we could spend two weeks on, on, on reading that because from 19, chapter 19 to basically the end of, end of the book of 1 Samuel, it talks about Saul trying to kill David. Saul was very jealous of David. Now, why was Saul jealous of David? If you turn back to chapter 18, verse 7, it says this. These are the people of Israel shouting this. It says, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Verse 8, Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have, they have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. And if you skip down to verse 12, it says, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had left Saul. You see, from that point on, Saul is trying to kill David. His throne is threatened. He's very jealous of David. So he wants to get rid of him. So like I said, over the next several chapters in 1 Samuel, you see where many attempts on David's life, where Saul tries to kill him and get rid of him. But it didn't work. Every time David eluded him or God was with him and saved him and spared him. There was actually a couple occasions where David could have killed Saul. But he chose not to because that's not the way God wanted it to happen. David knew that God didn't want him to take the throne because he killed Saul. It was to be handed to him. It was to be a privilege, anointed, named king. So years pass, Saul tries to kill David repeatedly, which brings us to 2 Samuel chapter 5. At this point, Saul has died. Saul has died in battle. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, we're going to read verses 1 through.
through 5. It says this, All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king. And he reigned for 40 years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in, in, reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. I just want to stop right there for a second. So David's king. I find this interesting. You can take this however you want. But why in the world, 2 Samuel chapter 5, talks about when David becomes king. If you look at the numbers, this fascinates me, and I really didn't look into it a whole lot. But if you look at 30 years old, David's 30 years old. Someone tell me what that symbolizes. Jesus started his ministry when he was 30 years old. You can take this however you want it. I think it's linked somehow. Um, I don't know if it is. And then... David reigned for 40 years. Over all of Israel and Judah, he reigned in Scripture. What's it say? How many years? 33. When did Jesus die on the cross and rise from the dead? At the age of 33. Let's just find that interesting. How in the old second Samuel is linked to thousands of years later when Jesus arrives. And the fascinating part about this is that Jesus comes from the bloodline of David. So don't sit there and tell me this doesn't have a meaning behind it. From right then and there, God's man after God's own heart, David, becomes king. The anointed king. He didn't, he didn't seek after the crown. And honestly, David probably didn't want anything to do with it. But God sought him out because God knew his heart. David was a scrawny little boy when God saw his heart and said, You, David, are going to lead my people and be one of the greatest kings to ever live and rule and lead my people, the nation of Israel. So I find that fascinating that those two numbers, the numbers in the Bible, if you really look into it, the number, numbers in the Bible mean a lot. And a lot of the times, Old Testament numbers are linked to New Testament numbers. And that's just another foundation that the Bible never changes. That the Bible is so solid in what it says. And we can't take anything away from that. You know, from 2 Samuel chapter 5, 30 years old. Jesus was 30 years old when he started his ministry. J David reigned for 33 years. Jesus was crucified at the age of 33. I find that fascinating. I find that that is truly linked somehow all right so david has just been anointed king all right david had some good comp accomplishments as king in his reign here's three of them we're gonna look at three of them he conquers jerusalem he defeats the philistines and he brings the ark to jerusalem those are some pretty amazing feats because no king has ever done this yet. David is the first to do that. But as we read on through 2 Samuel, we, we come to chapter 11. We come to chapter 11, and David, like any other king, has his failures. And this is, I, I, I love this about David because if it wasn't important, it wouldn't be in the Bible. See, David was a man after God's own heart. Everybody thought he was perfect. But David was human. David was, was still a man. And David was still searching for something. He had a lot of accomplishments as king. But he also had some big failures. Power caused by pride. You see, David, David was a king who was very much a king that loved 
his people, looked after his people, would die beside his people. And then he became powerful. He became king over pretty much everything at that time. And then power got in the way, which was caused by pride. If you read in, in chapter 11, verse 1, it says this, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war. Notice it says, when kings go off to war. Who's the king at this time? David, right? In the springtime, when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out of the king's men and the whole, out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. But David remained in Jerusalem. See, it was at that point where power and pride started taking over and clouded his judgment. Instead of going out, he, he was so prideful and so felt like he was so powerful at that time, he said, I don't need to go to war with these guys. I'll just send them out and do my dirty work. Instead of going out with them by their side, he sent them and stayed. He had that power. He, he felt that power that he didn't have to do what normal kings actually do. And when that happened, it led to that. Adultery. David committed adultery. And then his adultery eventually led to murder. So how can a man after God's own heart do these things? Because he was human. Because he was completely and totally human. You see, when David starts as king, he starts very well. He, he, he's actually a great king overall. He unites the country. At the time when he took over, they were separated. He, he, com, he took all the tribes of Israel and combined them, united a whole entire country that became very powerful, feared. He won great battles as his reign of king. He worships God with all his might. Everything he does, he gives God the glory for. He truly is a man after God's own heart. And in return, with all of these great accomplishments, David never took, took credit for that. He always gave the credit to God. And in return, God promised to give David a never-ending dynasty. And then it all goes wrong. And then David kind of becomes human again. Starts acting like a tyrant. Starts taking whatever he wants for himself. Even if he has to kill to get it. But the, the, the cool thing about God is, and this is something we can take from David is, we can't hide from him. David couldn't hide from God. See, where it all starts going wrong is there at the beginning of chapter 11 when it's time for a king to go out to battle, go out to war with his men, and David didn't. And while David remained in the palace, he found eyes for this gal named Bathsheba. This is where it all started going south for David. As we all know the story, David was up on the rooftops walking around and he looked down to, to see this, this beautiful woman bathing. So David found lustful eyes for her, sent his servants to go get her. He brought her up, slept with her, committed an adultery. A lot of the times from up here, people don't like that to talk about that, but guys, this is true. This is David, a guy that we're supposed to look up to and, and kind of almost model our hearts after his. And we're sitting there thinking, how can we model a, a heart after a guy who did this? Well, you see, David, David was a man. He made mistakes. And his mistakes just kept snowballing and snowballing and snowballing. Not only did he, he sleep with Bathsheba, he got her pregnant. Oops. So what's he do? He sends for her husband, being the king, and he says, I want you to, you have been hard at battle. You have been fighting your tail off. It's time for you to take a break. Why don't you go and spend time with your wife? He's trying to cover it up to where maybe his, his, her husband would go and, and 
sleep with her, and then it would just kind of all be covered up. So he was scamming. He's already committed adultery. Now he's trying to cover it up and, and scam all the people. That didn't work out because Bathsheba's husband basically said, I'm not going to sleep in my own house, the comfort of my own bed, when my men and my leaders in the army are sleeping in tents and in dirt. I'm not going to do that. So what's David do? David's like, well, I can't have this because this is going to ruin my kingdom. This is going to ruin my throne. So David goes to his general, goes to Joab and says, put him on the front line. Put him on the front line where the fiercest battles are taking place. And when the war really, when the battle really starts getting tense, I want you to pull back and not tell him. David sent him to war. To die. David sent him to war to die. So David has committed adultery. He has lied. And now he's committed murder. But the cool thing about David is he understands when he was wrong. If we read in chapter 12, Nathan comes to David and says this. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it. And it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives... The man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house. Because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. But because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. You see, Nathan rebukes David. Nathan comes to him and calls him out for what he has done. But this is where David is so unique. Because unlike Saul, David didn't make excuses for his sin. David being humbled and broken hearted. He acknowledged his sin and poured out his feelings. And like so many times when this happened, it became a psalm. In the book of Psalms, this one particularly at this moment, was Psalm 51. David wrote because he was humbled and broken hearted. 
See, there's three things that we can learn from David. First one, walk humbly. Walk humbly. If you turn to Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Miles shared with us, shared with us this verse a couple week, weeks ago. He said, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. You see, David was humbled by the same sexual weakness known to many men in our world today. But unlike many men, David understood that this sin he had committed had broken a relationship with God. David was torn up by that. He understood that, that he defied God. He broke that relationship that that covenant that, that God had with him, he broke that. And there's nothing he could do about it. He was truly broken hearted. He had disappointed God. He had disappointed God by his pride, his lust, and his murder. See, David's sin was a, a, was a breach and a divine friendship that needed a repairing. Sometimes I think... Our pride gets in the way of our own lives. Our pride gets in the way to where we don't really understand the friendship or the, the mending that needs to happen there. See, David's heart broke. His heart was a heart after God's own heart. And he understood that. God understood that. And it was breaking. Which leads to this, repentance. You see, David's repentance was real. It was true. It was heartfelt. Notice the word I keep coming back to, heart. But even though David's repentance was real, there were still consequences for his actions. See, David was filled with remorse. So he asked God to forgive him. God said yes. Because God values the person who respects his holiness and treasures his friendship. See, like so many times, once again, David expressed his gratitude for, for God's gift of forgiveness in a psalm. Psalm 32. See, David, David knew he had sinned. David knew the friendship that he had broken with God. He understood that. And he fell to his knees and became humbled before the Lord and said, God, I'm sorry. I love you. Please love me back. I know I don't, I don't deserve it. But yet, I'm sorry. And he truly meant it. See, sometimes I think when, when we repent... Sometimes I think in our, in our own lives, words are enough. We feel that if, if, if we say, God, please forgive me, I repent of my sins, that's enough. Words mean nothing. Because God knows what's in here. Each and every one of us sitting in here could, today could fall to our knees and say, God, please forgive me. And it's just words coming off our lips. See, when David did this, they weren't words. They were actions. It was true because it came from his heart. So what was this, what formed the center of David's intriguing personality? Love. It wasn't power. It wasn't greed. It wasn't all the normal styles of a normal king. It was love. It was his love for God. See, David was a man full of drive and passion. We read about, if you read his whole life story, he was full of nothing but passion. Passion for God. You know, his 
his wealth was secure. And his family was like a small village. I know how he feels about that. His family was the size of a small village. But the cool thing about David was, yes, he was very thankful for that. But if you take all of that away, you take all of the wealth, the numerous amount of descendants he has, God's still there. Because none of that really mattered to David. When you dig deep down inside, none of that that really mattered to David. Because he loved God. See, God was the generous giver and loving father who led David from childhood to old age. And like so many times I said before, David's poetry really paints a beautiful picture of his relationship with God, which is a protector, father, father. And Lord. If you turn to your Bibles real quick to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. This psalm really paints a picture of what David thought of God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David truly was a man after God's own heart. He shows us how to walk humbly, the true meaning of repentance, and most importantly, what love looks like. So my question to you today, what are you after? What are you after? David was after God's heart. Yes, he screwed up and yes, he made mistakes along the way. But he truly is an example to follow. If he wasn't an an example, God wouldn't have used him. See, he truly felt the disconnect from God when he had sinned. But when he repented and asked God to forgive him, God felt it in his heart. It wasn't words coming off of his lips. It was from his heart. And God felt that. And God felt that David truly did love him. So not only was David after God's heart, but God was after his. God was after his. And centuries later, like Terry shared, through David's bloodline, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to show us the way to him. Not just to deliver us from our sins, but because God truly does desire us and love us. It comes down to God being after our hearts. You see, some of you in here today, this might be the first time you've ever heard about David or or even the word Jesus mentioned. The name Jesus and what it means. And for some of you, this is old news. But that doesn't mean you can tune me out right now because there's still more for you to learn. You see, there comes a time in our life when we have to examine our lives and ask ourselves this question, what am I after? You know, for those of you who don't have a relationship with Jesus, maybe your focus should be the king, which is Jesus. And for those of you who do have a relationship and know Jesus, maybe your focus should be after the kingdom. Becoming kingdom workers. Doing the work to further and grow the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're called to do. You know, I, I love this illustration. We learned this last weekend. This is the first time I ever heard it. If you look at the word kingdom worker, okay, king being the center. You take out the king, 
you have dumb worker. It's kind of funny when you first hear it, but it's true. Because God created us. God created everything inside of us and around us. And our, if we're truly after God's heart, then we're going to become kingdom workers. And if the king is not involved in the kingdom work we do, then we are merely dumb workers. We are just going about through the motions. There's nothing, nothing that we're after if we are not a true kingdom worker. Which means our lives are not centered around the king. We're just going through the motions and we truly are dumb workers. Because we have nothing to look forward to. So I want to end with this right here. Simple question. What am I after? What am I after? Not me. You. Us. All of us. Ask yourself the question, what am I after? Am I a person after God's own heart like David? Or am I after fame, fortune, wealth, material possessions? So when you go home today, look in the mirror and truly look at yourself and say, what am I after? What is my purpose in life? I can't answer that question for you. Only God can. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for everything that you do for us. First and foremost, I want to thank you for another day. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son to die for us. Thank you for seeking our hearts. I just pray as we leave here today that we just seek your heart as well. Thank you for loving us and providing for us. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.